Welcome everybody to Wesley United Methodist Church in Winona's uh, worship. We um, thank you for coming. In Winona's worship? <laughs> yes. We thank you for being here, for tuning in, whether it's uh, Sunday morning, Saturday night, wh whenever it is <laughs> that you're going to be watching the service. You're joining in us in spirit, and we, we welcome your presence with us. And we have a few announcements for you. Actually, we have very few announcements for you. Um, we want to remind you about our current Wesley for Winona emphasis, which is our Polish Museum and Cultural Institute, or the Polish Cultural Institute Museum, whichever way. Um, you can go to their website and find out more about that if you've missed the earlier announcements, but that is going on. And then coming the second Sunday of September, we will be unveiling our next emphasis, and you're just going to have to wait and see what that is, right? I cannot wait. I, I think we're cannot. supposed to say something. What are we supposed to say? That we're going to be... Um, uh, being partners with the uh, Historical Society. Oh, is that the next one? Yeah, I got permission <laughs> to mention it. You know, Yay, yes. And all their work of telling the story of Winona. Yes, so we will be, starting in September 13th, we will be walking alongside the Historical Center here in Winona yep. and how they have told the story of Winona's heritage, mm -hmm. how they continue to lift up the stories of the people who have lived here through things like Cemetery Walk and things like that, how they have preserved so much of our history and mm -hmm. the good work they do. So sure. that'll be coming up. You'll know more about it later, but just a teaser, just so you know. And again, if you want to give to Wesley for Winona, you can do that through your regular electronic giving through your bank. Just make sure you note that it's for Wesley for Winona. You can do it through your credit card giving. Go into your Vanco account and there is a line item you can designate for Wesley for Winona. Or you can simply contact our finance secretary and let her know what you would like to give and she will make that happen. And then a reminder that you are all invited after worship from 1130 to 12 to gather in the West Lawn Bring your own chairs, bring your face masks, and we'll have a time of fellowship together. Robert and I actually won't be there this Sunday because we'll be at a church council meeting. But you are obviously more than welcome to gather without us because you're kind of really the body of Christ, whether or not we're there or not. Right? I think so, yeah. Did you get lost in all my knots in that sentence? No. I, 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 I'm a what? What? Okay. I don't think we have any other announcements, do okay. we? Okay. Okay. Then, let us prepare to worship together as the body of Christ.
let us join in prayer. Much like Joseph's brothers so long ago, we come to you today hungry, desperate, broken, and lost. We are searching for healing and hope. Eternal God, you call us together as your family. You call us with our broken parts. You call us when we feel alone and abandoned. You call us when we doubt and when we are afraid. You call us when we hold on to our anger or are filled with despair. We hear you whisper, come closer, inviting us into your heart. We want to come closer to you, even with tears running down our faces, hearts still clenched tight with bitterness still afraid to be hurt and betrayed again. O oh God, in our worship, touch us, embrace us, pull us close to you, mold our broken pieces together again. Give us hearts for you, healed and opened up to your great love by your Son, our Savior. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our virtual children's moment with Anne and Andy and Molokai. We are really excited to be with you today and we're excited to tell this part of Joseph's story. If you remember, last week Joseph was thrown in a pit by his brothers because they were so jealous of him and all the favors he got from their father. Well, time has passed and Joseph ends up being the Pharaoh's right-hand man and helping run the whole country. He has a lot of power. He's put away food because there's a famine and lots of people are hungry. And the brothers are coming to Joseph, not realizing it's Joseph, but they're coming to Egypt to beg for food so their whole families don't starve. So that's the situation we're in. Now Joseph has a choice, just like we always have choices. He can choose to say no to the brothers he can choose to punish them for what they did to him. He can choose to throw them in a well or a jail cell. He can choose to do any of those things. Or he can choose to go ahead and give them the food they want. Well, I, obviously Molokai is choosing to leave. Um, but not let them know who he is. He can choose to give them food to take back and never ever build the family back together, never ever let them know what happened to Joseph and their brother. He could choose all of those things. But in the story, that is not what Joseph chooses. Joseph chooses to let them know 
who he is, to offer them his care, his embrace, to show them that despite all these horrible things, his love for them is bigger than the bad that happened. So it's a great story about coming back together and and recognizing how important it is to acknowledge and care for those ties that bind us together and keep us one family. Well, we are the family of God. We are God's children, and we are all bound together by these cords of love. Like Joseph was to his brothers, we are to each other. So I have a bunch of ribbons, and I thought we would talk about what it is to be part of the family of God. So I have ribbons for... Well, let's see. This is for all the children of the church. This is, oh, all the children that we see every Sunday. Carolyn and Ben and their new baby sister, Leah. This is Emerson and Everett. This is um, Aiden and Oliver and Eleanor. This is our children. This is them. And here's for our parents. And here's, this one has got to be the choir because look at that, that's just too much fun. So there's the choir. And then we have, this is the United Methodist Women of the Church. And these are the Wesley guys. And here are our youth group, all the youth. And here is our musicians, Janelle and Eric, and all our singers. And here are, have I done teachers already? I can't remember. Well, if I didn't do teachers, this is teachers. But this is also uh, the people who make coffee and set out cookies for us to drink. Well, we don't drink the cookies. And I don't drink the coffee. And you probably don't either. And this is for the people that vacuum up the floors and keep the church clean. And this is for all the people that come and worship and, and feel their hearts opened up by God and grow in faith. That come every Sunday or come when they can. This are all our members of our church who can't come together even outside of times of pandemic, that aren't able to make it to church. They're still a part of our family. But right now, they're like scattered all over. This doesn't look like one thing. But because we share this love of God, we are all connected. So there's different ways we can imagine being connected. We could imagine being connected by, oh, tying a knot. And then just tying all of them together into one long string. And we could do that and think how far we could reach if we did that. Or another way to think about it would be if we just took these all together. I got to find all my ends. All my ends. Here we go. Have I got them all, Molokai? Nope, I haven't. Here's some more, and here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another one. Okay, I think I got them all. And we could tie them all in one great big knot like this and give them an end. And now they're connected here, but they're still all loose. And that's the great thing because we are tied together in a way we can't separate, but we are free to do the different things that God's Spirit allows us to do, which means some of us might be the Joseph who provides food when we're hungry. Some of us might be the ones who can make us laugh when we're feeling sad. Some of us might be the ones who provide food for Super Tuesday or for families when they're facing illness. And some of us might be the ones that just bring joy. Some might be music. Whatever God's Spirit does, we're all able to move separately, but we're held together by the love of God. That's how we are united. That's the love that Joseph felt for his brothers. That's the love that opened up the brothers' hearts to welcome Joseph back into their family. That's the love that God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. That's the love. Let's pray. 
Molka, you want to come pray? <laughs> Loving God, we appreciate that you made us all different, with different gifts and different graces and different ways of being in the world and looking different and acting different. But you bind us together with your love. And we know that when we come together, we can do the things that your Holy Spirit is asking us to do, empowering us to do, calling us to do. Thank you for bringing us together through your love. We pray this in Christ's holy name. And Molokai, let's say amen. Bye-bye. Scripture comes to us from the book of Genesis using the common English Bible from chapter 45 verses 1 to 15 Joseph reveals his identity Joseph could no longer control himself in front of all his attendants so he declared everyone leave now so no one stayed with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers he wept so loudly that the Egyptians and Pharaoh's household heard him. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. 
Is my father really still alive? His brothers couldn't respond because they were terrified before him. Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they moved closer. He said, I'm your brother, Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. Now don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Actually, God sent me before you to save lives. We've already had two years of famine in the land, and there are five long years left without planting or harvesting. God sent me before you to make sure you would survive and to rescue your lives in this amazing way. You didn't send me here. It was God who made me a father to Pharaoh, master of his entire household, and ruler of the whole land of Egypt. Hurry, go back to your father. Tell him this is what your son Joseph said. God has made me master of all of Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You may live in the land of Goshen, so you will be near me, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and everyone with you. I will support you there, so you, your household, and everyone with you will not starve, since the famine will still last five years. You and my brother Benjamin have seen with your own eyes that I'm speaking to you. Tell my father about my power in Egypt and about everything you've seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. He threw his arms around his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And ben Benjamin wept on his shoulder. He kissed all of his brothers and wept, embracing them. After that, his brothers were finally able to talk to him. The word of God, or the people of God. Thanks be to God.
One of the things that our family loves to do is to watch movies together, and we love to watch the animated movies from uh, Disney and Pixar. Uh, there's one particular movie that uh, I adore, and the rest of my family aren't that crazy about it. And once when I asked my sister if she enjoyed this movie, she said, no, nah, it's too much rats in the kitchen. The movie is Ratatouille. And it's, my wife says she loves that movie. Notice I didn't say you. Okay, so the movie is about this, a rat who has this exceptional ability to smell the depth of food and to taste in ways that no human can. And he ends up going to Paris and he connects with a, a young man who, who is just entering into being a chef, being a Sioux, and, uh, and, and they form a relationship and he ends up being able to cook through the hands of this young man, a very awkward young man. And he becomes this amazing chef in all of, all of France. And he receives the attention of one jaded um, food critic named Anton Ego, who decides to visit the restaurant and to write his reaction, his column for it. He comes in and he's just so incredibly arrogant and he sits down at the table and everybody knows he's there and this is a make it or break it for this restaurant. It has to be good. And so Remy, the rat, who is the chef, understands that this uh, has to be wonderful food. And so the waiter comes out and says um, nervously, uh, uh, what, can I, what can I prepare for you? And Anton says, I would like a fresh, well-seasoned plate of perspective. What? Perspective? Yes, bring me some perspective. And so what follows then is Remy, the rat chef, hears this and he creates a peasant dish. And everybody in the kitchen is going, what? this is a nothing dish. And he seasons it according to his amazing smell and taste, and they present it to him. And as soon as Anton Ego tastes it, he is transported back into his childhood. And he's able to see differently because of the opening up of his senses. Perspective is on the menu today as we look on Jacob's story. Because when his brothers came back to him and they didn't know at first who he was, but they were begging for the life of the youngest son. And they were telling their story. Judah was telling the story of, of how his father would just be devastated because he's already lost one named Joseph. And he cannot afford to lose another one, a Benjamin. And Judah came forward and said, I will be a slave to you in his place. It was at that point that the scripture records that Joseph lost all control. He ordered everybody out of the room and he just started weeping. And he made the confession, I'm Joseph. I'm Joseph, the one you sold into slavery. His brothers were terrified because they thought that he was dead. They were terrified also because they lived in a culture not unlike our own in which retribution was the order of the day. Revenge was on the plate. And they were afraid that Joseph would kill them all. And Joseph said, do not be afraid. It's okay that God has brought me here to save lives. I understand that. I see that now. Now, the only way Joseph could have gotten to that point is he, he got it for himself a well-seasoned, fresh plate of perspective. And sometimes we think that it's something we have to go deep within ourselves to offer forgiveness, to create reconciliation with those whom we hurt, to be able to work out a future for relationships. I'm not sure that that's possible without perspective. Psalm 61, 2 reads, I am weak and faint. O Lord, put me on a rock that is bigger than myself. Perspective. I can't do this. I need to be placed somewhere where I could see afresh, where I could hear again life, life-giving. 
The story of Genesis begins with the awe and majesty of a world, of a universe exploding into creation. And it ends with the awe and majesty of an act of genuine forgiveness and reconciliation. As the path that we are on continuously, when Jesus comes on the historical scene and he preaches that simple sermon, he says that the that the kingdom of God, you've got to change your lives because the kingdom of God is near you. The kingdom of God is in you. It is all around you. God is not creating evil in order for good to triumph, but God, through human folly, through, in, around us all, as we mess up our lives, as we create divisions among us, God's Spirit is moving over that chaotic water to restore us to God's self. This is, this is deep, difficult stuff. In 1864, November 29, 1864, there was a raid on um, an Indian encampment. Uh, this, uh, this was in uh, Native American encampment. This was in uh, Colorado. And uh, it was a horrific moment uh, at Sand Creek. And the raid was by about 100 uh, soldiers from the Colorado uh, Cavalry Volunteer Army. And at dawn, they moved in upon this settlement. And the, the Native Americans, Cheyennes, uh, were there, only there as a group, to work out the grievances, to create a new, new path for them with these soldiers. And the soldiers came, and they slaughtered them. 160 died on that day, 160. Three-fourths of them were children, women, and the elderly. If you want to look up the Sand Creek Massacre, there are eyewitness details of the atrocities that were levied. Once 160 lay dead on the field, the soldiers went back and they, they scalped and they dismembered. And they took the scalps and they would show them at theaters in Denver. And people would applaud. They thought at the time, what a great success, until they begin to hear more and more of the stories of the, the atrocities. Now, why is this an issue for the Methodist Church? It was because the governor at that time was a noted Methodist layman who allowed this policy to be possible. And the man who led the invasion was a Methodist minister, ordained in the Methodist church. It had, the story had been forgotten, except from the Cheyenne people. It was news to the Methodists when our bishop from, from uh, Washington, from the Pacific Northwest, was the bishop in that area, and she began to hear stories. And they took a year of listening, a year of respectful listening, to hear what happened at Sand Creek. And she then, with the Methodist Church, under the idea of, of all the listening that they did to hear the atrocities and that the Methodist Church had been, not just because one Methodist pastor blew it, but because the Methodist reaction by and large was to turn their back, to, to come alongside this pastor and say, oh, you know, we love this man and he did a good thing. The work of forgiveness and reconciliation on a global scale like that, when atrocities are involved, when there's a history of slavery, when there's a history of oppression, how do we work through that? How do we disentangle that? What can Joseph's story tell us about how to get to that rock that is bigger than ourselves so that we don't look at Black Lives Matter a, a poster, and all of a sudden we have to shout, white lives matter, all lives matter, in order to kind of even things out. But we could say, oh my gosh, we need to hear deeply and take responsibility and be like Judah, who says, this is our sin. We did a horrific thing to our brother. And out of that confession, Joseph's emotions, his, his soul was laid open, and he embraced his brother's and he restored them. He says, I will take care of you. Joseph needed to hear from his brothers of their grief and the pain that they were bearing because of what they had done to, to them. 
we need to hear from the people who suffer at Sand Creek. To the point where a few years ago, Bishop Elaine Stanowski uh, led a group down of 600 uh, United Methodists, and they met with these uh, families of the survivors. They met with them, and they, they uh, enacted a, a ceremony of, of contrition. We are aware now. We don't anticipate that there's going to be immediate forgiveness, but we want to be on the road to heal the divide that we have participated in by our silence even. And they took the biblical model, they took ashes and they put it on their head as an act of contrition. We acknowledge the pain that we participated in. One of the hardest things to do. Forgiveness, reconciliation, though it might not be easy, it comes out of perspective. Joseph was able to say, the end, I hold no grudge against you because I can see deeply that God has used all of this so that I could participate in the preservation of life. And that is what we are called to do and to be, to preserve, to heal, to be a part of the fullness of another being. And if that means to be able to get on your phone right now and to call your brother, your sister, maybe in a family, maybe a friend that you need to reconcile with. To start the process of reconciliation, to start the process to be a forgiving person, to get yourself up on that rock that is bigger than yourself. And in the church, in this proclamation, we confess there is no rock greater than Jesus Christ. Jesus is that rock that grants us perspective and enables us to do the work of Christ who on the cross offered us all that healing moment of forgiveness and that embrace of the entire world in God's redeeming love. Amen. As we prepare to move into a time of prayer as the body of Christ, let's take just a moment and lift up specific joys and concerns for our community here in Winona and for our world. We didn't receive any new joys or concerns this week, but we want ongoing prayers for Becky in her continuing struggle with the COVID-19 virus. Prayers for all the educators, parents, and students as they wind up for their fall semester and our, the uncertainty that goes with what that looks like. Prayers for the over a thousand staff and students who are now facing quarantine in Georgia following the opening of their public schools. Prayers for this whole process of the pandemic as it affects so many of the ripples of our life. I also personally am going to ask for prayers for my brother-in-law, Alex, who is, well, right now he's in the hospital, but he's going to be released to a rehabilitation center fighting off issues related to a fall he had. So just Lift him up and his wife, I am, in your prayers. I would appreciate that. And, of course, prayers for the ongoing unrest in Lebanon following the explosion a week ago in Beirut. Prayers for our nation as we move into a highly divisive political campaign. Prayers for grace and peace. Let us pray together.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. as we conclude our worship, it is the beginning of a further worship, which are to become the hands, mouth, the eyes, the ears of Jesus Christ in the world. As we arise from that rock, that is our ground of our being, to be the followers of Jesus Christ and to love the world into his unbelievable 
redeeming love. We are sent in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Thank you.